welcome back to another edition of the Nonprofit Leadership Studio. Hey, for those of you that are tweeting, make sure you're doing POLS 6310 under dash M-K-E-H-M-K-E. -E. Uh, I know that we put it on the blackboard as 310, it's 6310. Make sure we get your tweets. I'm not gonna look at 310, I'm only looking at 6310. Uh, hey, we have a great guest tonight here in the studio. Lee Emke is the head of the Houston Zoo. And uh, for those of you that know me, you know I love zoos. And so, Lee, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, my so, pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. And you're relatively new to Houston as well, right? I am. I think month 14 right now. Wow. And are you enjoying it? It's been great. Very um, good. Yeah, it was advertised as a warm, welcoming community, and uh, it's lived up to it. In and it's certainly warm here. Uh, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from Minnesota, very warm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I always ask each guest, the first question is, you know, Lee, if you're writing sort of the, the empty guide on leadership, uh, what are some of the key chapters for you in a leadership book? You know, I think chapter one is humility. Mm -hmm. I really, I think I um, realized to understand what you don't know and to rely on people who do uh, can help you with that and understand that, you know, you may believe you have a vision or a, a clear idea of where to go but it's always gonna be tempered by other people's opinions and other people's mm. thoughts. And I think it's important to keep that in mind all through you know, any kind of leadership challenge. Wow. When, when you think about, I wanna get back to other chapters, but when you think about coming to Houston and certainly through the interview process and visiting and reading, you probably developed a vision. How did that change as you met people in the community and you met staff? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, what I was looking for was the sense that the zoo and the community that supports the zoo were moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And that was very clear to me actually before I even came to interview, just knowing you know, the zoo community in the United States is relatively small. We all talk to each other. We're all following you know, how the industry is going in different parts of the country. And the Houston Zoo for the last seven or eight years had been really noted as one of the zoos that was moving in the, the progressive direction of mm -hmm. being a conservation-based organization. Um, and that the zoo itself was having great financial and attendance success. And so in many ways, I saw it already queued up. Uh, the things that I guess I was a little surprised with were the, the infrastructure of the zoo, although there's been a lot of improvement there. There was probably, you know, once you get in and start digging in, you find that there's maybe it's more. It's shabbier that, than you thought it was. Uh, there's, I, I won't quite go to that <laughs> level, but there's more work to be done than, yeah. than um, you might have expected on the surface. So. Um, the other thing I was very pleased with uh, coming to this community, and it's not so much about the zoo itself, but it's the, what's happening in Houston with the greening of Houston, mm -hmm. uh, the park systems, the trails, the connections between uh, neighborhoods, and uh, the kind of the, the landscape architecture renaissance that's happening in Houston, and that the zoo is very much part of that. I wasn't expecting that, so mm -hmm. that's actually been a, a really pleasant surprise. Wow. So what else in terms of your chapters in your book? Is there another thing about leadership that's important to you? Um, listening. I think that's the mm. other one. I, I, um, have not, it was great to come in. There's an amazing staff at the zoo and an amazing board that supports it. And before, um, you know, it's always, it's, you kind of want to get in and dig in and start saying, okay, we're going to do this and that. But I spent many months really listening to what the community had to say, what the staff had to say, what their impressions of the zoo and what their their interest in uh, the future of the zoo was gonna be. And I think that's um, held me in good stead as we've started to put together a strategic plan and a long range master plan for the zoo is having a good sense that it's not just a personal vision, but it's something that is coming from many constituents. Uh, Houston always sorts of, it, we always see ourselves as sort of a world-class city or a about to be world-class <laughs> city. When you think of the top zoos in the world, how does, you know, what are they and how does Houston compare to those? Um, I think we're moving into that top echelon, I think, and it's in different ways. You measure excellence in zoos in a lot of different ways. You can look at, you know, attendance and budget and staff, kind of the big metrics. But more and more importantly, I think for zoos today is what's the conservation impact? What's the educational impact that you're having on your community and on the world in general? And in some of those areas, the Houston Zoo has really taken a leadership role already, in particular uh, the wildlife conservation piece and the bringing together the community and finding ways to have, you know, how can you get someone in Houston to do something here in Houston that's actually gonna help save gorillas? Mm -hmm. How do you make those connections? And I think that this zoo has been well ahead of that curve in finding ways to do that. 
So from that perspective, we're a leader. And yeah. that was one of the things that attracted me to come, uh, uh, knowing that that leadership role had already been established by the zoo. But there are other areas, and we kind of hit on it before, yeah. the infrastructure and the exhibits and some of the things, you know, the physical facilities of the zoo, there have been some massive and major beautiful improvements made, but that's only to a portion of the zoo. And we're looking now at how do we bring the rest of the zoo up to the level of quality that's exhibited by the, the, the new gorilla exhibit in particular. So if the gorilla exhibit is the best part of the zoo, what's the part that you want to change first or is, is most in need of changing? Well, it's really, if you look at the zoo, most of the new development has been on what is perceived of as the back end. Yeah. Uh, the far kind of, so really it's from the entrance in. I think there are mm -hmm. a lot of older facilities there that you know are adequate, but they're not, um, they're not big wows and they're probably not, they're certainly not state of the art. And I think it's important, you know, as in any real estate, you know, curb appeal is really critical. Yeah. You want people to get a great impression as soon as they come into the zoo. And I think the opportunity is to really work on uh, really the north side of the zoo, the front half of the zoo is the focus of our current master plan, although there are plenty of opportunities to do improvements elsewhere too. Yeah. <laughs> when, uh, when I think of a zoo, I think, wow, this must be a super fun atmosphere. Obviously you have the same challenges. You still need to raise money and manage your board, just like any other nonprofit. But because it has, it has sort of this idea that it's fun, is it easier to attract staff? And once they're there though, is it harder to get them to, to focus on the business that needs to be done? Um, you know, zoos in general, you know, people who are attracted to work in zoos are there because of the mission of the zoo, mm -hmm. um, almost exclusively. So, and then you have the environment of, you know, if you're having a bad day, you go outside and you, you watch some sea lions. You know, it could be worse, <laughs> right? That's right. So I think um, we tend to attract people who are already predisposed to wanting to, you know, put, you know, the conditions of working in a zoo can be rough at times. It's also, mm -hmm. it's hot work if you're outside mm -hmm. working with the animals That's right. or on grounds. Um, you're dealing with lots of people, uh, two and a half million people a year, and you have to be good at that. So I'm not going to say there aren't challenges there, but I think the opportunity both to work in a place-based organization that is you know, quite beautiful and fun, and also knowing that the work that we're doing is going to have an impact you know, well beyond the experience of those animals and those people who are at the zoo, I think that's uh, pretty compelling. So we get some great people coming to work with us. When you were a kid, did you ever think that you would end up working at a zoo? Uh, I thought I would, that was the only thing I ever thought I would do. Really? Um, as a kid, yeah. and I, got, I got serious and sidetracked later and be, I went uh, to school and had a poli-sci degree and had a law, uh, got a law degree and practiced law for three years, although that was, it was focused on environmental law, so there was okay. sort of a thread that, that flowed through that. But my earliest memory, actually, is I think I was three years old, was seeing a rhino at the zoo in Fresno, California, mm. and talking incessantly about that to my parents. And that <laughs> became my first love and continues to this day. Just fascination with animals, uh, concern about animals, and then that um, more broadly turns into a concern about the environment and how we make sure that we're protecting uh, what's left of you know, the wildlife of the world. And you went to Berkeley undergrad, you have some advanced degrees from Berkeley, you also at Hastings, which is one of the UC schools uh, for law. When was the, f what was your first zoo job? And then subsequently, what was your first sort of leadership job within a zoo? Um, well, I actually had practiced law for a few years and realized I was really interested in what was happening in zoos from a design perspective, that the physical manifestation of a zoo was changing to really represent the conservation mission of zoos, mm -hmm. and that that was primarily being done through landscape architecture. Instead of building buildings to put animals in, the idea of creating habitats yeah. that people and animals could share. So I went back to school with a very specific idea of doing that professionally, um, even though there were only you know, a dozen places in the world that were practicing that at the time mm -hmm. in the late 80s. Uh, but I went in, sort of created my own curriculum. Uh, none of my professors in landscape architecture knew anything about zoos, but I came in knowing how I wanted to apply it. And they probably the, loved that you had that idea. They though. did. No, they yeah. were all very interested in it and yeah. supportive. Um, and it actually, a research grant that I got to do my thesis turned into a job interview. I went to the Bronx Zoo in New York mm -hmm. um, pr strictly to do research for my thesis, but by the time that afternoon ended, it was a job interview and I was hired when I finished the wow. master's program. So I went immediately from Berkeley to the Bronx Zoo, which is in many ways probably the leading um, example of a zoo-based conservation organization that was also in the 80s and 90s going through a huge renaissance in terms of exhibit design. So I got to work on some- It's a beautiful zoo, isn't it's, it? It's gorgeous. And yeah. I got to work on some extraordinary projects, both at the zoo 
And then the organization that runs the Bronx Zoo also does conservation work globally. So I had a chance to travel to Africa and Central America and do work on education centers that were also live animal exhibits in the native countries of some of the habitats we were trying to protect. So I got my dream job as a result of that career change and have never looked back. Wow. And from the Bronx Zoo, is that when you moved to Minnesota? From there, did you go to Minnesota? That's right. At the Bronx, I was an exhibit designer. Eventually, I was in charge of the exhibit design office of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is quite big. I had architects and graphic designers and landscape architects all working on uh, a number of projects. So I was leading that group. But Minnesota, I was uh, asked to come in and serve as the CEO and zoo director. So mm -hmm. that was a big step up um, with a much bigger um, portfolio, but also um, you know, a wonderful opportunity because the Minnesota Zoo was actually established in the 70s when the concept of zoos was already changing. So oh, yeah. from the beginning, it was focused on creating natural habitats for animals and being a conservation education center for the state of Minnesota. Um, there were some opportunities to take it to the next level and uh, spent 15 years there doing that and enjoyed every bit of it. <clears throat> Tell me about that transition for you leadership wise from being sort of a cog, you know, at, at the Bronx Zoo and then going to becoming the leader uh, at, at, the Minis at the Minneapolis, is it the Minneapolis Zoo or the Minnesota Zoo? It's actually Zoo? the Minnesota State Zoo. It's okay. actually one of only two state owned and operated zoos in the country oh, and wow. it's outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul in okay. suburban Apple Valley, Minnesota actually. <laughs> what a fun place to be in Apple yep. Valley. So becoming the leader there, you must have had you pro probably made some mistakes along the way. Yeah, there were some growing pains. Um, yeah. I w had gone from you know managing a smaller group of people, and uh, I'm not sure I was a cog, but I was um, <laughs> okay. one of many um, working in a large <laughs> organization corrected. to leading um, a pretty you know sophisticated group of, of people, mm -hmm. and with the challenges that come with any organization. And I think you know some of the mis I, I, I can look back and say. I probably did not make some of the personnel changes that really needed to happen as quickly as I might mm -hmm. have. I was um, you know, a little hesitant about that early mm -hmm. on. Um, it's and hard to do that, isn't it? It is hard. There's yeah. no, no question about it. And uh, it's even harder in a state zoo where there's, a, <laughs> you know, there's some challenges to, to move yeah. people along. So, so when I look back, that, that might have been um, the primary mistake I made. And then I, and it's interesting because I'm applying the same thought process as I've come to Houston, the zoo in Minnesota did need a, a plan. It had kind of been mm -hmm. drifting for a number of years. And so I went almost immediately into a physical master planning, which was my sweet spot, that's what I was mm -hmm. trained to do, uh, mode, but didn't really do the step of doing a strategic plan and thinking big picture about um, the organization and what it wanted to be when it grew up. And, mm -hmm. and, the, and it maybe was not quite the right sequence of, of planning. So mm. um, that, having that um, experience when I came here to Houston, it was very clear to me that we did need to do that global look at the, the organization and where it wanted to, you know, how it was going to evolve, and that from that, of the physical vision for the zoo would emerge. When you look at your time at the Minnesota State Zoo, is there one thing that you'd say was your greatest success there? Um, well, I think I, I can say I turned it around uh, yeah. because it was a zoo that was seeing declining attendance, decline. It was uh, because it was a creature of the state. It was also the legislature, uh, Minnesota State Legislature, was really key to its success or failure. And when I arrived, it had zero credibility with the legislature. And when I left, I think um, it was very well supported financially and um, you know, people love the zoo. Mm -hmm. So you know, that came through a number of um, changes. I think one was really reinforcing the conservation and education mission of the zoo that although it's still, and zoos are still often primarily perceived of as, edu as a recreational institutions, a place to take the family. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's fantastic. But there has to be, I think, a higher purpose for a zoo uh, in, in the 21st century. And the Minnesota Zoo, that needed to be kind of reestablished. And then there was, the, again, the physical redevelopment. So I built some pretty spectacular uh, and cutting edge exhibits there that started the attendance flowing in the, the What was your big direction. one that you're most famous for? It's there. called Russia's Grizzly Coast. And you know, this is Minnesota. So yeah. instead of focusing on tropical animals like you might hear, the focus there is on northern climate animals. And one of the great wilderness areas of the world that people basically know nothing about is the Russian Far East, where the Pacific Ocean yeah. meets Russia and China. And it's the only place in the world where you have tigers, 
uh, grizzly bears, sea otters, leopards, and uh, all living essentially in the same place. And did you do that? We there? represented that environment and uh, the fact that it's also second only to Yellowstone in terms of the geothermal activity, so geysers and hot oh, wow. springs and all that. So that was part of the recreation. Did you get to visit Russia's grizzly coast? Uh, did not. Um, that uh -huh. was gonna, that's one of the tougher places in the world to get to. I would so, so a lot of research, a lot of talk with people who had spent time there yeah. and, re and scientists, but I, unfortunately I never got there. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, having grizzly bears uh, fishing for uh, salmon uh, behind glass uh, right in front of you and seeing sea otters right up close but also in a big naturalistic environment with geysers and steam vents and the like uh, is a pretty, it was an award-winning exhibit and that's when the attendance really turned around at the zoo and was also um, dr driving conservation funding to help support some of the animals that are from that environment, some of the, the leopards and tigers. Um, we were providing financial support and scientific support to help save them in nature, which I think again is that integration of the wild and what we do yeah. in zoos. Uh, represented really well. So that was fun. That was and, good. And I love zoos, so I'm probably asking too many zoo questions, but uh, but I'll get back to leadership questions. But one last one. I, I wonder when you think about Houston and what the possibilities could be as you've talked to your staff and big donors and interested parties, and you think of something like Russia's Grizzly Coast, what are some ideas that have emerged uh, that you could do in Houston? Well, this is a little premature because we haven't, uh, yeah. the board has not approved the, the plan that we're working on yet, yeah. but I think uh, we've been working through that and that's gonna happen in the next few weeks anyway. So it's not really gonna be a big secret. Mm -hmm. But the idea that I'm really excited about right now is having as soon as you come into the zoo to bring people into the Galapagos Islands. Wow. Um, and there's some good reasons for that. Yeah. Um, there's some animals that we have at the zoo who are in need of new housing, and those would be sea lions. Mm -hmm. And although sea lions live in Calif along the California coast, they also range all the way down and are a major uh, animal in the Galapagos Islands. Um, our uh, lead vet, uh, Dr. Joe Flanagan, has spent many years in the Galapagos Islands working with um, conservationists there on giant tortoise uh, mm -hmm. conservation and, and reintroduction. So we have a connection to the islands there that is not evident to someone visiting the zoo right. now wouldn't know it. Yeah. Uh, there are also amazing, you know, there are green sea turtles and sharks and animals that live in Galveston Bay and in the Gulf that are, are similar species that I think we, we can tell stories about local wildlife related to yeah. those in the Galapagos. And I think it would be, number one, spectacular. Um, it's yeah. an amazing uh, environment to recreate and, and to talk about it's also unique. It would be um, no other zoo in the world would have done that kind of exhibit. Wow. So I think you know, there's lots of great ideas in other zoos that, and zoos are pretty known for copying each other's good yeah. ideas. Yeah. And that's great to a point, but it's also nice to have something that's unique. And I think this would be a very uniquely Houston Zoo um, um, feature when yeah. they get it done. So, Tell me about the, uh, <clears throat> the board at the Houston Zoo. I mean, are people there, uh, is the board there because it's it's all about the mission? Or are they there because their buddies are there? Talk about that board and how you manage the board. Well, you know, the board, the Houston Zoo board has really matured in the last mm -hmm. several years and it's become a really, I think, an exemplary uh, nonprofit board in that um, it brings both the connections and the expertise of, of, you know, of very high caliber people who understand their role, um, which is to provide advice and to guide policy um, but not to get into the details of day-to-day -day management. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, you know, they understand as a nonprofit and a, with a, a place that has many financial needs that you know, financial contributions and finding uh, ways to support that directly and indirectly is really part of their role. So uh, of all the boards that I've had a chance to work with in my, my prof um, professional career, this has been the best. Wow. It's, it's a, a wonderful group of people. And most of them really are there because they, they love the mission of the zoo. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. And is your board, mm -hmm. would you say your board is a big fundraising board as well? It is. Yeah. Um, between you know, direct fundraising and then the opportunity to bring, you know, we just, for example, last week had our conservation gala, which raises money uh, exclusively for our conservation programs, raised over a million dollars this year, which was the, the first time we've hit that mark for that particular fundraiser. And that was really about bringing, um, you know, board members, bringing their friends and getting people excited to come to the zoo for a wonderful event. Um, mm -hmm. But using the network uh, and the amazing community here in Houston of people who might not be that familiar with the zoo, but coming to an event like that 
increases the opportunity for not only that evening's um, fundraising, but for the future as well. As the leader of the Houston Zoo, what has been your biggest challenge to date, sort of management-wise? Um, well, I think what the management structure that I inherited um, was a little, we had sort of a divided leadership role where we had a CEO and a zoo director. Oh. And that's a very unusual model. Yeah. Um, and there was some ambiguity about responsibilities, I think, for some in some areas with that. I don't want to say, you know, obviously the success of the zoo, it happened under that structure. So yeah. um, can't argue with the success, but I think there were some staff members who were a little confused about roles and about, you know, how it was going to work uh, in a new structure with a single point of authority, the CEO. Mm -hmm. So that adjustment period, it didn't take that long. I think once um, people understood how that was going to work, that's been fine. But initially, there was a little, um, that's change, and change is always hard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as a leader, how much time do you find that you're doing fundraising uh, as opposed to managing the zoo? Um, boy, and that, I know sometimes they're it, one and the same, aren't they? They, they often blur. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, at this point, it's probably 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot, you know, I think, you know, whether it's fundraising or just becoming um, familiar with the community, those are you know, kind of integrated things. So uh, there's a very major external role for the zoo CEO. I need to be out there representing the zoo, uh, meeting people, getting, getting them to care about the zoo or to even be aware of the zoo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the flip side, of course, is we've got 450 people at the zoo who need um, care and attention as well. So yeah. right now, I'd say it's pretty evenly divided between the two. <laughs> when you look at the uh, landscape of nonprofits in Houston, especially for you being relatively newly, I mean, are there a couple of other nonprofit leaders that you sort of become your buddies? And who are some of the nonprofits that you've been working with? Um, well, almost immediately, I've been doing a lot of work with the uh, Herman Park Conservancy. We are mm -hmm. part of Herman Park. Uh, there have been times in the past where maybe the relationship between the park, the conservancy, and the zoo um, wasn't perfect because we were all, you know, kind of moving in different directions. But I've been really pleased to be working with Doreen Stoller, the executive director of the mm -hmm. conservancy, um, and the and the parks department as well. And we're, I think we're all kind of on the same page as we look at. Mutual challenges, you know, parking and access and circulation in and around the park are really mm -hmm. key th issues that we, you know, we all need to address and we need to address it together. So from almost day one, uh, Doreen and I and the Conservancy and I, I think we're, we're very much working in tandem. It's, it so happens that the uh, Conservancy and the park are doing a 20-year master plan right now at the same time the zoo is. So we've had the opportunity to bring our design teams together uh, and make sure that we're working Mm -hmm. uh, not at cross purposes, but at, in uh, the same direction. So, you know, from from day one, that's been a great relationship. All the other museum directors in the area, um, you know, I've had a chance to meet with many of them, and um, all of them are very, you know, it's a, it's a great community and very supportive and uh, and very impressive. I mean, what the yeah. MFA is doing right now, right, stunning. Uh, I was amazed to go into the uh, Natural Science Museum and see, you know, having spent time in New York. Um, and the Natural History Museum there is certainly one of the world's great, greatest. But the dinosaur exhibit here at the Houston Museum, hands down, um, is better. So, <laughs> and then the butterflies. I mean, there are a lot of yeah. yeah. No, it's do, do, do you get this feeling as you as you get to know Houston, especially the nonprofit community and the community? There is this sort of like everything is possible here. Absolutely. Now I heard that coming in, yeah. um, and I've seen demonstrations of it everywhere I turn. You know, one of the things I, I mentioned, the, you know, the greening of Houston and how that was a surprise to me. Um, mm -hmm. But to see something like Buffalo Bayou uh, Park, you know, coming, I've seen pictures of what it was just a couple yeah. of years ago, and to see what an amazing amenity is now, and that was clearly the one of those, you know, a big idea that someone had, and immediately the community and members of the community got behind it and it happened. So. Yeah, I think it's an amazing thing. I think, I mean, I remember when I first moved here to work at Rice University, I don't think anyone was thinking we could make this an asset. It was almost like those are ditches almost, you know. Right. But it's turned into something really quite wonderful. So. Absolutely. So. That's very nice. And that's your aim with the zoo, turn it into something quite wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it is wonderful. It already right? is. Yeah. So this but, is not one of those complete miracle transformations, yeah. but it's really taking, you know, what's already been started and, and finishing the job. Yeah. And if I had to visit one zoo around the world that would uh, sort of uh, leave me in awe, which one would it be? That's a tough question. My favorite zoo in the world, yeah. um, and I think the very best, is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, people don't think of aquariums as zoos, yeah, but yeah, they are. I've been there, it's, it's uh, quite wonderful. Yeah, isn't it? no, I think um, in terms of being completely mission focused and everything they do kind of rolling back to support that mission um, and providing an amazing guest experience and really having impact both regionally and globally, uh, to me, that represents the best of what we can do in our, our business. Was that one of the first aquariums? It was the first of the modern wave of aquariums, yeah. among the first of the modern wave of aquariums. And um, yeah, it's just opened in 1984. And I grew up in the Bay Area, so I actually saw it happen. Um, and, and it's in an old fishery or hatchery or the something. Old, the old cannery. Cannery, cannery that's what it was. Yep, yeah, yeah, John Steinbeck and all yeah, that. So. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a stunning place. And then, you know, there are great zoos everywhere. The Zurich Zoo in, in Switzerland is certainly uh, world class. Uh, I love the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, which is actually a zoo and botanical garden in Tucson. Very mm -hmm. small, but again, does things exquisitely well. Um, I'd be remiss in not mentioning the Bronx Zoo, uh, yeah. my alma mater, which is uh, truly the epitome of a zoo-based conservation organization. And then no one does guest services um, like San Diego Zoo. So there are some great zoos out there. For many model. Americans, they'd probably say that's the most famous zoo, right? Absolutely. Bronx would be up there. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, people are tweeting in as we speak. Uh, so let me uh, uh, ask a few questions here. Um, so Kelsa de Prado wants to know, do you believe that having passion for animals is a key component to success working at a, a, a zoo? Um, it certainly helps. Yeah. Now, I think a passion, I mean, when you think about it, zoos are also as much about people as about animals. So we have a number of um, some of our very best staff people at the zoo are much probably more passionate about serving people and about mm. education and some mm -hmm. of the other things. And um, but I don't think any of them are there doing it without some pretty strong love of, of wildlife and wild places. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, a Perez wants to know, how do you ensure and motivate zoo employees? I mean, is there some sort of ethic around great customer service that you promote? Absolutely. Um, and we find, you know, it's interesting because even, you know, our front gate attendants and the people who are, um, we're finding ways to integrate them into our conservation programming. They actually help select some of the conservation programs that we work on and help reward some of the individuals in other parts of the world who are doing that conservation work. So I think making them part of the mission, making them uh, feel you know, very much responsible for creating a good experience for the guests as they come into the zoo, but also helping to, you know, for the ultimate mission of the zoo, which is saving wildlife. Yeah. And I think we um, have done a very good job of doing that at all levels throughout the zoo. Kawana Mays wants to know, as a leader, how do you uh, develop relationships and keep those relationships with your board members, motivating your board members? Uh, lots of communication. Um, when I f uh, first came in, the first thing I started doing was doing you know, every couple of weeks sending a, you know, just a quick kind of update on the zoo um, and a you know, statistical update, but also um, anecdotal you know, things that are happening just to keep people interested. You know, spending time, it's a very social job being, mm -hmm. um, being a CEO with a, a large board. So um, they've been wonderful about including me in some of the social events uh, in the city where other nonprofits are engaged. Yeah. So uh, communication and spending time. Um, one of the great things about the zoo is that we have a very event-focused kind of ethic. So we do a lot of things at the zoo where we invite people in, including our board members. And so finding ways to, to get people not just to come to a board meeting, but to come uh, Feast for the Beast, which is a big you know, culinary experience at the zoo, uh, musical events at the zoo. Uh, guest lectures, that sort of thing. But people like going to the zoo. Yeah, though, right? well, they're, they're, that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Janice Pender wants to know, how do you train employees and volunteers in regards to vision and mission of the Houston Zoo? Um, again, it's basic you know, communication. Yeah. So we actually have engaged them from the beginning in our strategic planning process. You know, we started out by surveying everyone, all of, all of the employees, all the volunteers, and to get input. And then we've been, um, as We've done iterative process here of reporting back on progress on the plan, um, taking feedback, and then uh, going back out. So, you know, really focused on strategic planning that is um, somewhat bottom up as opposed to top down, and really, again, back to that listening piece. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you, when you mentioned listening. I meant to say this, but uh, so many times, uh, women CEOs 
And uh, that would be one of the first things they talk about is listening. And I rarely, I mean, you're one of the first male CEOs that has talked about listening. And it's one of the things that I've learned in doing this class for a couple of years is the, this importance of listening. It can have a significant impact, can't it? It can. Yeah. Um, it gets you know, credibility and opportunity for dialogue and you learn things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, kudos to you. Um, uh, Valerie Garate wants to know, what's, what is your best fundraising tactic? Uh, and she goes on to say, how do you encourage individuals, individuals to donate funds to the zoo as, say, as opposed to a hospital? Um, I think the first thing is understanding what the individual or if it's an institution that's doing the giving, what their interests and priorities are. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one of the great things about the zoo is that you know, if you're interested in saving animals, that's certainly an approach. It's very easy to make that pitch, but it's also about serving the community. Uh, it's the educational piece. So I think a lot of it is doing a lot of, you know, research up front and getting a sense of what it is that the potential donor is going to be interested in and what's the avenue to, to approach them with. It's, uh, it's not a one size fit, fits all by any means. <clears throat> Christopher Gilbert wants to know, he says, some people don't like zoos and feel that, you know, that they're just for entertainment. How do you explain the mission around conservation efforts to people who say, I don't want to support entertainment? Um, it's a difficult argument, I think, because people, there is a pre-existing conception of zoos that we are, you know, as an industry, as a group of zoos, are trying very hard to change. Mm -hmm. I can recite the statistics that uh, nationally, the accredited zoos in the United States last year donated over $160 million worth of cash and services to help save animals in nature. Wow. which is equivalent to or bigger than any of the big conservation organizations that one might think of as a conservation wow. group. So we're actually putting resources into it. Um, there are a number of species that exist only because of the work of zoos. Um, if they hadn't been kept in zoos and bred successfully and then returned to the wild, they would be extinct right now. Mm -hmm. So I think the success stories of a number of those um, animals are as important. And then the other, and this is a little harder, but it's sort of dispelling the myth of the um, you know, the perfect wild, like the, the idea that the wild is, um, is paradise and zoos are prisons. Mm -hmm. And the reality is an animal living um, in nature is under stress con continually. Yeah. Most habitats are now being affected by humans in a negative way almost anywhere on the planet. And I think that the fact that people have, you know, we've messed with mother nature and it's now our job to kind of do what we can to fix it. And that's what good progressive zoos around the world are doing which is um, you know, taking action to help save not just the individual animals, but the species. So, um, and, and then of course, we're, we're focused not just on saving species, but the individual animals in our care deserve you know, a cradle to grave kind of approach to their welfare yeah. and their well-being. And I think there's been a lot of progress in understanding better what it is to make, uh, make sure an animal is comfortable um, and not just surviving in the zoo, but thriving. Mm -hmm. So. I think those efforts, a lot of the training and enrichment and um, habitat improvements that we're making, just showing people you know, what we're trying to do and the fact that we learn from our mistakes and that we're trying to improve continuously, most people, once they get that deep into it, will uh, start to come around to understanding um, what zoos, modern zoos are all about. Um, but it's not an easy initial conversation when you know, there's sort of a, a gut reaction to the idea of being confined and caged versus uh, free and wild. The reality is there's a very big gray area in between those things. And we're, you know, the wild is becoming much more confined and zoo-like, and zoos are becoming more wild and um, habitat-like. So, yeah. What will <laughs> zoos look like 100 years from now, Lee? Uh, they will not look like zoos today. Because yeah. uh, most zoos today are, are kind of a, a relic or a reminder of the origins of zoos, yeah. which was about collecting lots of animals for people to come to see. So I think you're going to see fewer species, um, mm -hmm. probably more individual animals of a single species living in larger social groups. Mm. You're going to see larger spaces for those animals. You're going to see um, you know, more naturalistic environments where the, the vegetation and the geology and everything about the habitat that those animals live in is going to be recreated with uh, greater um, specificity. Um, and you're probably going to maybe not, you, you will not see as many animals as you do uh, in a modern mm. zoo today because Again, I think zoos started as collections, um, and just like you know, a rock collection or a stamp collection, initially the idea was to get as many different kinds of things as you could and have them all in one place to, to see. Uh, the mission now has completely changed, and so that means that, that the visitor experience is also going to be very different. 
Do you think 100 years from now we'll be going to Herman Park uh, to see the zoo, or will we be going uh, 50 miles outside of town to see the zoo? Um, hopefully both. Yeah. Um, I think there's always going to be a role for urban parks. I mean, it's actually really interesting because, you know, the more things you, you think you know, onto new ideas, but you go back and I read things from 1975 about yeah. the, what, what the thinking about the zoo then. And there was really a movement in the 70s to say, well, the old city zoos are too small and we don't want to, you know, so we need to go out to the country. So there was a group of zoos called, uh, kind of labeled the utopian zoos that were all built in the 70s. The Minnesota Zoo that I directed mm -hmm. was one of them. Miami Zoo is another, the San Diego Wild Animal Park. Um, and um, the zoo in Toronto are kind of all great examples of it where big, you know, multi-acre, 500 acre sites outside of the city were devoted to zoos. And almost universally, they all kind of failed initially. Wow. Because um, th they were not part of the urban fabric. So in terms of the number of visitors going there, uh, the sense of that family experience that you get at an urban zoo, yeah. I don't want to say they failed, but they didn't um, live up to their promise without having uh, evolved into becoming more city zoo-like. So, mm -hmm. so what I've seen is that um, acreage itself is not the impediment to a great zoo. It's the creativity that is used within um, yeah. those acres. So, um, and there's plenty of land to do a Galapagos Island, or just you're, I think this idea of fewer species, right? It's sort of a right. Yeah, and and you know, selecting animals that are appropriate for where you are. Um, there's a reason I think that. The Houston Zoo has not had polar bears for a while, and certainly in, in our plans, we're not looking to do anything that, where you're really having to, to fight the natural environment that you're in in order to provide a good home for the animal. Uh, conversely, in Minnesota, not, not a lot of tropical animals. It was mostly northern climate stuff. Uh, Kelsa de Prado has another question. She wants to know, uh, do you have to handle a lot of scrutiny from passionate animal activists? Is this... Uh, something that you have to deal with here? We do. I think it's, it's everywhere. And I think, um, you know, in our connected age, it's not necessarily um, animal activists from Houston. It's more the networks of people around the yeah. world who are, you know, very quick to criticize anything that happens at any zoo that can be seen as a negative. So in that sense, yeah, we're, we're um, constantly dealing with that perception. But I found the community here in Houston um, almost universally is very they're supportive of the zoo, um, love the zoo, yeah. um, and understand why we exist and, and want to support us moving forward. So Aubrey McKenzie wants to know, how do you get uh, the public to understand that you guys aren't solely entertainment? I mean, do you find that a lot of people think, oh, going to the zoo is all about entertainment? How do you change that perception? Um, very good question, and I think right now you could walk into the zoo and not understand what we're doing to help save animals in the wild. So finding ways to communicate those messages, um, and that can be through signage, it can be through interaction with our staff as they tell the stories about the zoo and about what we're doing. But I also think it is a truly a physical design question that if you go into an older part of the zoo that are typical cages, you can have all the great signs in the world up about what we're doing to help save these birds in the Marianas Islands, but what you're actually experiencing doesn't um, jibe with that directly, so there's cognitive dissonance sometimes. Mm. So a lot of it really is the transformation of the physical experience of being in the zoo. The, the idea that I'm really, I, I'm a believer in, is this concept of landscape immersion that if we can bring people and bring them into the seemingly into the same environment that the animals are living in and that that environment recreates the natural habitat of the animal, there's an implicit message there about the connection between the animal and the environment um, and a different kind of relationship between the visitor and the animal. It's much more respectful. You think about you know, walking through on a park, in a national park and seeing animals, it's a very different experience than yeah. the classic walk along and look at animals in a cage. So a lot of it is, is about really doing the design right um, mm -hmm. and making the whole experience, um, you know, without even using signage or having anyone speaking to you, kind of that implicit experience is really key. That said, we can augment that with really good um, audiovisual signage, um, you know, using technology to yeah. um, you know, have the experience begin before you get to the zoo and, and follow up. You know, it's a whole host of different tactics, but. But certainly, can um, you follow along on an app right now as you go in the zoo? Uh, yeah, we have beacons, and there's you know there's ways yeah. to gen. But I think right, it's been that's been an interesting dilemma for zoos, is because you know, one of our claims, and I think it's true, is that 
we're about the real, uh, yeah. we're about real life. That said, uh, you can't fight technology and you can't <laughs> fight culture. And we found, you know, this winter we had, or this summer, ex excuse me, we had lots of people using technology in the zoo looking for Pokemon. Um, Did you have any in whoa, the zoo? Matt, yeah, 20 or 30. Oh, wow. Including a few that were in construction zones. So we had to do a little special <laughs> signage to discourage uh, people jumping over. But I think that really does, to me, that uh, sort of indicates there's going to be an opportunity to meld uh, the virtual world with the real animals and the real experiences that we offer and make it richer. I'm not yeah. sure Pokemon is quite the yeah, way to do it. Yeah, but you can see when you just think about Pokemon, start. you could think of ways that it could be a richer experience, I Absolutely. guess. Absolutely. When you uh, see a movie like Jurassic World or Jurassic Park uh, and the sequels, uh, do you get ideas like, oh, uh, we could do something with that? Uh, mostly ideas about what not to do. Um, <laughs> and I think, and that's actually, it brings up a big, uh, both scientific and kind of ethical question about you know, saving species versus recreating species. Because yeah. the technology, you know, there's going to be a time when we probably can clone a mammoth. Um, mm -hmm. If we, and the question would be, why would you do that? Um, mm -hmm. When there are so many existing species that, you know, the resources and, um, and the, the need to help save them, yeah. to me, should trump the yeah. kind of the scientific, uh, the fun. But someone will do it and sell a lot of tickets, won't they? I think so. I think, yeah. I think it's inevitable that some of that's going to happen. But um, yeah. how do we, you know, again, focus on what's really going to be important and what, has, what provides ecosystem services as opposed to kind of a freak show down the line? And I guess mm -hmm. it depends who's on your board in terms of that pressure. I guess if you've educated your board well, <laughs> they're with you on this idea that we shouldn't recreate. But there could always be someone on there, I guess. Oh, that's true. And it's interesting because you talk about the evolution of a board. Because I think when the zoo privatized in 2002, it was a struggling institution. And there was a lot of pressure to you know, generate revenue um, and yeah. figure out ways. You know, how do you get people into the park? And how do you um, find ways to sell you know, experiences or, or things? And as the institutions matured and become more financially uh, stable, I think it's been an evolution both you know, for the staff and for the board to say, you know, we need to filter everything through this conservation mission that we've now, you know, defined very clearly in our strategic plan. Um, and it's been great to see a board and and the staff really align all in the same direction and understand this is the, this is the, where we need to go. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not those competing uh, needs that might have been there a few years ago have have vanished. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> very good. Um, so uh, Abe uh, Perez has another question about, uh, in terms of having a high-performing team around you, what do you think are the keys, Lee? Um, well, providing motivation, um, good selection. I mean, there's really, you know, it starts from you know, the hiring. How do you yeah. make sure that you're getting the right people on board and that they're there for the right reasons? Um, you know, I think one of the great things about a mission-based organization like the zoo is that a lot of the re the rewards that incentivize good performance are not the usual ones of, of pay and and um, you know getting promotions, but it's more about seeing the impact that you're having on the people using the zoo, the animals at the zoo, and in the, on the world. So, but I think it it really does come back to you know careful selection. Yeah, to start with. <clears throat> All right, let me get down here a little bit. A lot of a lot of questions. Um, so Andrea Kirkpatrick wants to know about your background as an exhibit designer. How did you get into the, this idea of being an exhibit designer? You know, that goes back to my three-year-old self, seeing animals in zoos yeah. and then drawing, um, you know, drawing animals and then thinking about how a zoo might look. Um, and from pretty early on, I have a drawing um, that I've been using in some of the slideshows when I introduced myself around town my nine-year-old master plan for a zoo that was laid out <laughs> zoogeographically and with predator-prey exhibits, and it was pretty sophisticated. It was just, for a nine-year-old, right? Nine, except for the handwriting, it was a little <laughs> rough. But um, So I had always been interested in the idea of how you exhibit animals in zoos and how it could be done better. So mm -hmm. that was sort of a you know, childhood interest that, again, I got practical uh, when I went to college, and that sort of went by the wayside for a number of years. But then in the mid 80s, I did see this small profession emerging of people who were doing it. And again, taking it from a landscape perspective, thinking about a zoo as a landscape with animals as opposed to a series of human you know, houses mm -hmm. with animals in them. And that just got me very excited. And um, 
there's actually a, a group of design firms out of Seattle, Washington, and the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, which is another one of the zoos I would describe mm -hmm. as really a leading place. And from that small cadre of people, it's sort of now become a, a global um, movement around creating habitats for zoos. So that, that was what got me interested, and I got there in the mid-'80s just as that was starting to emerge as a, a major thrust in landscape architecture and zoo design. <clears throat> uh, Lutishi Taylor wants to know, uh, your decision to come to Houston to lead the Houston Zoo, how did that come about? Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the zoo community in the United States and even the world yeah. is actually pretty small. Um, I've been, um, I'm actually just rolling off as the president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is a global... That's a big deal, isn't it? It was a great, it was a huge deal. Yeah. Uh, very, it was a great honor to be selected and yeah. also a lot of work. It was an unpaid position, so <laughs> on top of my, uh, my day job. Um, so... Um, you kind of know, again, what institutions are, are moving in, in the right direction. And as I said, the Houston Zoo it was, was starting to gain a reputation as really mm -hmm. starting to do some exciting things. Um, and knowing, again, the support that the city of Houston uh, has been giving to other cultural institutions. So it just seemed like the stars were aligning well for me to come. Uh, you know, to, and I think the exhibit design and planning talents that I have mesh well with some of the needs of the zoo. So it, Absolutely. It just seemed like the right thing to do at the time, and here I am. It's been great. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, Lydia Sims wants to know, in terms of leadership, how has your leadership changed from the zoo that you were at in Minnesota to the one here, and what are the atmospheres? How different are those atmospheres? Uh, that's a, another great question. Yeah. Um, I guess you realize when you've been at a place 15 years and then you come to a new place that you're starting from the ground up. So mm -hmm. I was able, I think, in some ways to do things differently than I started out doing in Minnesota. I learned from experience about, you know, maybe listening a little bit more and also making some key moves earlier. Mm -hmm. um, both of those things have happened here. Um, the atmosphere here, I think, was probably a lot more positive than the one I started in, in yeah. Minnesota because the zoo has been on such a, a nice upward trend. Um, so it wasn't coming to fix things so much as to continue yeah. um, strong momentum. Uh, so it was nice to walk into a place that it wasn't so much of a turnaround, not at all. It's more of a how do we take this platform and, and take it to the next level. I know people are friendly in Minnesota, but are they friendlier in Houston? Um, you know, they're friendly in both places, okay. I will say, in different ways. Um, that's, a, that's a good political answer, too. And, and so. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let me ask one or two more questions. Um, did, oh, this was... Uh, did you have passion? Did you have a passion for animals as a child as well? Uh, from day one, yeah, as far as I can remember. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, how difficult is it to lead? This is Jen Lu Cook. How difficult is it to lead uh, in a fun environment? Is it difficult at all? Um, well, it's interesting because even fun day after day. I mean, it's obviously the zoo is an enjoyable place, but it's a serious job, um, mm -hmm. and there are big responsibilities, and there are crises, and there are um, human. So in some ways, the challenge sometimes is to remind yourself that you're in a fun place. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's any harder than anywhere else. It's, it's probably, it's helpful to be able, like I said, to walk out the door, yeah. uh, walk around and uh, smell the fresh air and see some amazing animals and see people having an amazing time. That can really be a refreshing um, break in the middle of the day when you're having a rough day. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, now to the fun questions that we always finish up the interview with. Do you have a favorite restaurant in Houston yet? Boy, there's so many. Um, it's going to be hard to pick, but I am a big fan of, of really spicy Szechuan food. So Mala um, oh, yeah. on Westheimer is, mm -hmm. has become a go-to place for me. I People really, love that place. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Do you go to El Real as well right next I've been, to it? I've been there a numerous times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just living in that neighborhood, it's uh, there's a wealth of opportunities. So. There's, there's never... Uh, uh, you're never out of options, yep. are you? So. Hugo's, boy, there's, there's, I could go on and on. Yeah. It's a great, great food town. <clears throat> and are there, have you found sort of a, a, a off the beaten path, path type of place in Houston that you sort of like your secret? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good because you haven't been here very long. I so have a hard thing to. No, I I I credit myself with discovering because it had just opened when I got here. But the Dunlavey restaurant in oh, yeah. um, 
Buffalo Bayou Park. Now it's super popular. Yeah, not a secret anymore. <laughs> <laughs> First few weeks, I was, you know, was, it was pretty easy. But to it's see. nice to go on a weekday morning, right, to the Dunleavy. Yep, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Very fun sort of, sort of place. Uh, do you have a favorite animal, Lee? I'm sure this is the most common question you get. It's also the one that I'm probably not supposed to answer because how can I have a favorite among all all All, all, eight all your children that but, are the animals. But the I reality know. is I go back to that first experience as a kid, the, that memory of a rhino. Um, yeah. at the Fresno Zoo, and that has stuck with me. I just, I'm fascinated by them, and I love them. So Do, do we have a lot of rhinos We, we here have three white rhinos here at the zoo, and they're yeah. um, very, um, you know, white rhinos. There's, different species of rhinos have different temperament. The white rhinos are very um, somewhat cow-like and very pretty mellow. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing like being up close to those animals and realizing this is the closest thing that's living on Earth today to a dinosaur in terms of the scale and the power. Um, they're just incredible. So yeah. I love rhinos. And do you have a work-life balance? Um, I'm lucky that my work um, and life are pretty much the one and the same, and I love it. So, so, so that would be no. <laughs> that's no. <laughs> but this is pretty much what everyone says here. So. No, and it's great because I've actually, I, my um, significant other uh, is a woman named Sue Chin who lives uh -huh. in New York and works at the Bronx Zoo, and we have a commuter relationship. And oh, that must be hard. Actually, it's very easy. Yeah. Uh, we, everyone says exactly that, but because we're so focused on our work um, and we both love what we do and we're both kind of, we can talk about the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, every other week, one of us will fly to see the other, and and then every night we talk, and you know, often, yeah. often talking about zoos and animals and our challenges, and um, it's been great. So, and I guess you pile up the miles. Uh, the miles that. have piled up. And, yeah. Um, but it's been great because um, you know the, exploring the food scene here in Houston and figuring out wow. where to ride a bike and all that good stuff has yeah. been been a new adventure for both of us. And your next vacation, mm -hmm. where will it be? I uh, haven't planned that one, but um, I'm hoping to go to Namibia in Southwest Africa. Oh, yeah. It would actually be leading a trip, so I'm not sure it's really a vacation. It's going to be part of work, um, part of our fundraising um, yeah. to get people out. And, but it's also obviously an amazing opportunity. And, and again, back to the rhino thing, uh, one of the great things that the Houston Zoo is supporting a rhino conservation program in Namibia that's really the only one in Africa that's working right now. I mean, I'm sure most people have heard about the huge poaching crisis that's yeah. going on. Um, but in Namibia, local communities have been given the option of deriving revenue from the ecotourism um, of people who want to come and see rhinos, and as a result, the communities themselves are helping to protect the animals uh, from the poaching that's going on pretty much everywhere else in Africa. And it's a special rhino that lives there. They're the desert-adapted black rhino. So the, the Namibian desert, which is a very sparse place, and you wouldn't think it could support big animals like rhinos, but there's uh, a group of uh, subspecies of rhino that's really done well there, eating primarily euphorbia plants, which are sort of like a equivalent of our cactus, that if we touch the euphorbia, we'll, um, you'll burn. I mean, it's that caustic, wow. but these animals have adapted to eating this. So they're tough critters, um, but it's also a magnificent landscape, and I'm hoping to get out there and introduce some people to that and to the rhino conservation wow. work we're doing. Do they, do they cut the horns off the rhinos to protect them there? That has been done in a number of countries in Africa. There's a lot of debate about how yeah. effective that is. I, um, my last trip to South Africa, they were doing a lot of that. Is that, yeah. is that a good idea? Or? Um, uh, from my opinion, and again, there's debate about this, sure. but I think not because the rhinos have horns for a reason. Yeah. Um, they're not decorative. They're part of their you know, natural defense mechanism to help you know, to yep. joust with other rhinos or other yeah. animals. And taking that away, I think, really takes away you know, one of the things that makes a rhino a rhino. That said, um, it also probably makes them a lot less vulnerable to poaching. Although you know, the sad reality is that even after cutting the horn, there's still the base of the, the yeah. horn, which is really, it's the same material as your fingernail, it's keratin. Mm. So whatever medicinal purposes people think they're getting from rhino horn, they could chew their fingernails and get the same, same thing. Yeah. Um, which is no benefit. By the right. Way. Yeah. And, but the cutting of the horn, there's still a little bit left, and unfortunately, the value of that material, it's now worth more than it's uh, in, by weight than gold. So there's still something there that a poacher might find a value even if the horn's been cut off. Yeah, so it's, sad it's thing, effectiveness it? is very questionable. Yeah, very good. It is sad. Lee Emke <laughs> is the head of the Houston Zoo, the chief executive officer there. Lee, thank you very much for you. what you do, and thanks for being here in the class. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, very nice to have you. Uh, that's it for the Nonprofit Leadership Studio tonight. Uh, we'll see you next time here at the studio, and until then, keep up the great work. Take care.